In today's video, we're going to continue working with Taylor series. We're going to start by finding a Taylor series for sine of x. Well, we've already done that, right? But before we had done the Maclaurin series, which was centered on x equals 0, today we're going to do it centered on x equals pi over 3, which is going to be very similar. You're going to notice it's a little bit more annoying because our derivatives won't be so pretty. It won't just be a bunch of zeros and ones. But there's still numbers we can handle. So let's start by remembering the process for equating derivatives because we start by thinking about the derivatives at all levels of f. So that would be f of x. Start with that and then find the first derivative and second derivative and third derivative and fourth derivative. And let's go up through fifth derivative. That should be enough for us to find the pattern eventually. And this is just sine. So we know the derivative of sine, and then the derivative of that, and then the derivative of that. We've seen this one already. It's the same as before. If I'm writing this too fast, don't forget you can always pause the video. Make me stop while you catch up. And what makes this a little bit more frustrating, again, is we're going to be evaluating that not at x equals 0, like a Maclaurin series, which is so easy with sines and cosines, but at pi over 3. So f of pi over 3, and then we're going to find f prime of pi over 3, and f double prime of pi over 3. And now, these aren't going to be zeros and ones, but they are numbers that we know. So we should still be able to do this fast, even if it's not going to be quite as pretty as what we're used to. And the last one is the fifth derivative of pi over 3. And we'll see the pattern here. We're switching off sine of pi over 3, cosine of pi over 3, sine of pi over 3, cosine of pi over 3. So we just need to remember what those are. Sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And the cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. And the next time around, they'll be negative. And the next time around, they'll be positive again. And notice the language I'm using there. The next time around, they will be positive. What that means to us is when we're talking about the next time around, that's going to be helpful when we use our sigma notation to kind of describe the pattern. Their pattern is coming in groups of two. So we're going to keep that in mind for when we get to our sigma notation later. Either way, we're going to find the coefficients for our polynomials using the same formula as before. This is that little formula for the coefficient. At every level, for every nth coefficient, it's the nth derivative of f divided by, divided by n factorial. So we've got all the derivatives of f already, we just need to divide them by n factorial. So c0 would be the zeroth derivative, or plain old f of pi over 3, divided by 0 factorial, which means divided by 1. And the first derivative would be the first derivative divided by 1 factorial. And sorry, I said the first derivative. I meant this is the first coefficient. The second degree coefficient will be the second derivative divided by 2 factorial. Well, I'm going to put that divided by 2 factorial in the denominator here. And sure, that's just 2 times 2, so I could call that a 4. But I'm going to leave it this way so that um, we, it'll help us to recognize our patterns when we need them later. And then the third co degree coefficient will be the third derivative divided by three factorial. The fourth derivative, this fourth degree coefficient will be the fourth derivative divided by four factorial. And again, I remember I'm using the word divided by and it looks like I'm multiplying, but that's because I'm multiplying in the denominator. So that's really the same thing as saying divided by five factorial. So we've got all of our coefficients, so writing the polynomial itself should be pretty straightforward switch up colors. I'm going to write this underneath here so I've got plenty of room because these are going to be some long terms. My polynomial is the constant plus the first degree term. But remember that each of my terms, instead of just being that coefficient times x, it's times x minus a. So that's 
x minus pi over 3, still to the first power. And then the next coefficient, sorry, that was positive one half, not negative one half. The next coefficient is negative root 3 over 2 times 2 factorial times x minus pi over 3 squared minus 1 over 2 times 3 factorial times x minus pi over 3 cubed. And it's possible that you need to write a couple more terms to see what happens here. It's possible that you see the coefficient, the pattern of the coefficients already. Um, since I've already written found c4 and c5, I might as well write them out. Notice that this time we've switched to a pair of positive terms, root 3 over 2 times 4 factorial times x minus pi over 3 to the fourth. And then my quintic term is still positive because these come in pairs, 1 half divided by 5 factorial is the coefficient we found times x minus pi over 3 to the fifth. And now my job is to turn that into sigma notation. And here's the key. What we saw were these terms that are coming in pairs. So what I'm going to need to do with my sigma notation, there's going to be no way to describe this using only one term in the sigma notation because everything is coming in pairs. There's the first pair. There's the second pair. There's the third pair. So what I'm going to do with my sigma notation is describe each of those pairs in my sum. So it would be the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. And I'm going to just describe the two terms separately. The reason why I have to describe the two terms separately, there are two reasons. Number one, my alternating signs, the first term, or they're both going to be positive. And then the second pair of terms, they're both going to be negative. So the signs with a g are switching off you know, in groups of two. But the coefficients are switching off every term. The root 3 over 2 and then 1 half. Root 3 over 2 and then 1 half. Root 3 over 2 and then 1 half. So I've got one pattern that's coming in pairs, one pattern that's coming every individual time, which means I'm going to need to write the sigma notation with the sum of the two terms in one term like this. So you'll see what it looks like when I'm done. It'll make a little bit more sense. The first pair of terms, well, actually, let me say this first, that the terms are alternating. So the first ones are positive. Second, one, second pair is negative. So I'm going to put that negative one to the nth there. So that means each pair will switch off positive to the next pair negative. And then I'm going to put my pair of terms next. I'm probably going to run out of space here. But the first pair, the first part of each pair, the first term in each pair, is root 3 over 2 times that factorial there. But here's the catch. The, the first factorial, it's 0 factorial, one, uh, 2 factorial, 4 factorial. So I'm doing even numbers here. So that would be 2n factorial times x minus pi over 3 to the n. And that's it. That covers everything. I've got my alternating sign, my root 3 over 2, which is the same in all of these examples. And then I've got my... Um, Factorial, 0 factorial, 2 factorial, 4 factorial. I've got that covered. And my x minus 3 to the nth, oh, I made a mistake there. That should be x minus 3 to the 2n, because I'm counting even numbers to the 0 power, to the 2nd power, to the 4th power. And then it's the second term here that has the 1 half instead of root 3 over 2. And in the second term, I'm counting my factorials there are all the odd numbers. So we'll call that 2n plus 1 
not2n factorial. So you can see those same patterns we used last class for a way to describe even numbers as 2n and a way to describe odd numbers as 2n plus 1 is useful yet again. And in the numerator, we're also going to put the x minus pi over 3 to the 2n plus 1. And that is the sigma notation for my power series.